Okay, so we're going to do cell membranes, and we're going to continue on to amino acids and proteins after this. Uh, I did post the notes this morning, and I've already modified them. I recognize the notes this morning were missing some stuff, so. Did you say we were speaking some chapters? Or At the very end, we're going to compress some chapters down. So you're just getting some Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'll have to figure out exactly what we need to cover out of those. But it's all the different kinds of metabolism of carbohydrate, metabolism of fats. All that stuff doesn't need to be covered chapter by chapter. I don't think we need that level of detail, looking at the course description, the outline that we have. So um, we're going to talk about uh, lipid membranes, bilayers. And we started talking about these before. Um, what's the purpose of the cell wall? Yeah, it's to keep the insides and the inside, and the outsides on the outside. Um, it also uh, provides a, a semi-permeable membrane, and there's a lot of things that are regulated through that membrane. Um, we have, uh, just very quickly, in the draw. oh, shoot, if you look at this drawing, uh, each one of these little guys down here, what is that? Yeah, it's a phospholipid. And so you see the two little tails. That's a little phospholipid. This is, uh, you have an inside and an outside. The way they've drawn this one, the outside's at the top and the inside's at the bottom. And then stuff goes through the lipid uh, bilayer. We call it the bilayer because it has two parts. And there's a lot of things that are stuck inside this <laughs> lipid bilayer. We'll talk about those in a, in a little bit. The way things get through, there's three basic ways things get through the lipid bilayer. One is just by passive diffusion, and, and passive means it's just concentration gradient driven. So like if you look at your cell walls, let's say you have a cell like, that's your cell and this is the bilayer, okay. If there's a high concentration on the outside, It'll move to, and there's a low concentration on the inside stuff, just passively diffuses through the cell membrane. But the cell membrane is actually uh, fairly selective in what it lets through, and the, so the stuff that actually gets through is the small stuff, okay? Small particles can get through. Now, we also have um, what's called facilitated transport. And it, the only difference between passive transport and facilitated transport is in facilitated transport, there's a hole for it, right? And the hole is a protein that creates a channel, and when the channel is opened, that allows ions through, okay? And there's usually a trigger for that. It could be like a neurotransmitter, it could be like an internal signal, and, a, and something binds to the protein, so these are protein channels, and uh, we're gonna learn about proteins more in this next chapter, but these are proteins. Um, oh, I forgot the T. Prolines? They're proteins, um, and they have triggers to them that allow things to go through most of the time. Sometimes they just allow back and forth movement of ions, but generally it's some sort of triggered process. But again, in facilitated transport, it's a essentially diffusion-driven process. It depends on the concentration. If it's high on the outside and you open up the channel, the ions come through. So a given an example of something like that, um, in, your, in your cell, uh, okay, this section, if it's inside, is known as the intracellular side. Slow writing. You can only keep up if I write that fast. On the intracellular side, you have low concentrations, for example, of sodium. And of course, sodium is the ion form. You don't have sodium metal in here. That would be cool, though, if you had sodium metal on the intracellular side. And on the outside, you have high concentrations of sodium.
that diffuses through the cell membrane uh, through a sodium or potassium. The potassium has a channel. There's sodium and potassium channels that allow, they call those things, those pores, we call them channels. Okay? But again, those are proteins. Now, there's also active transport. In active transport, what does that sound like? Requires some input of energy, yeah. So that's all that is. It's usually tied to something. Actually, sometimes it's tied to the movement of another ion, or it's tied to the consumption of ATP or energy pulling ions through, okay? So we have diffusion, just passive transport. We have facilitated transport, and we have active transport. And only active transport requires the use of energy of some sort. Okay. All right, cool. Um, yeah, so I said it's semi-permeable. Cell membranes are semi-permeable. Uh, you can have nutrients passed back and forth through the cell membrane. You have to have cellular respiration waste products have to go through the cell membrane. Uh, there, and like so it's an intra and extracellular uh, environment. Uh, we often refer to the cell wall as a fluid mosaic model. Now remember, these are the same things that make up like oils, right? And except for in oils, they're triglycerides, but these are diglycerides. So they have the same kind of properties, and some are saturated and some are unsaturated. And as a result, the, the surface of a cell is actually fluid and flows and moves around, okay? So that's why we call it this fluid mosaic model. It's a mosaic, because what's a mosaic, by the way? Like, tiles. Yeah, like you think of the tiles, like people do in the bathrooms, they break up a bunch of glass and they make pictures. Of. Yeah, it's like a random, it, just, it sounds fancy, it's just a random assortment of junk all over the cell wall. Uh, one of the interesting things that's come out in the last 20 years is a lot of research on these. <laughs> There's actually a lot of carbohydrates at the surface of the cell, and that's one of the ways cells recognize, like, oh, this is a friendly cell, this is a foreign cell. Okay. Um, so this is the, the bilayer here. We're talking about this is a bilayer. And then what are these? Yeah, cholesterol, right? Cholesterol, and sometimes the cholesterol is modified and has a group on the end of it, but the the, remember, it's a four-membered ring, three six-membered rings, and a five-membered ring. That's the nonpolar part, usually. That's stuck inside the membrane. And then it, it's cholesterol. What's the OL mean? Alcohol. alcohol. So there's an alcohol functional group that's usually sitting on the outside. And it can be on the outside or the in, outer membrane or the inner membrane. Okay. So let's see what else. And then the proteins... Uh, I'm not, I don't remember if we go through the kinds of proteins, but there's different kinds of proteins, and some go all the way through, and some actually go in and never leave, right? Some go back and forth many, many times, and I don't remember if it's in the slides if you need to know that stuff or not, but I'll, we'll get there when we get there. Um, phospholipids, one saturated, one, one unsaturated, so that's why it's a fluid, because it's basically in this situation where it's a liquid at room temperature. Uh, proteins, carbohydrates, and cholesterol in there. Let's see what else is there. That's inter oh, yeah. Oh, wait, wait, we talked about it. So there's integral proteins. Those are the things that are the proteins that are in the cell wall. And we have transmembrane proteins or monotopic proteins. What does monotopic sound like? One side. One top, like topographical map. It's the, the map, the surface. It's only on the one side. So they either make channels or they're involved in things like electron transport, which take a biology class if you want to answer more questions on that, because I'm not going to go into electron transport. There's a lot of stuff. Right? And it's also part of how cells, like I said, how cells recognize each other. So what does the transmembrane sound like? It goes through the membrane, yeah. And sometimes they go back and forth several times. It depends on the kind of protein that it is. Uh, skip all that. Skip all that. I already said it. Okay. So transport of particles across the cell membrane from high concentration to low concentration is diffusion and or facilitated. Both of those are from high to low concentration. Okay. Huh? Active 
act, uh, the first two, facilitated transport has a channel for the movement of particles. Uh, diffusion or passive transport. What was that? Oh, it's like, it's, oh this is like our physiology class. Like, what are oh, sorry. <laughs> I will not teach that class. If it was neurophysiology, uh, neuros, yeah, pharmacology. No, but I would be happy to learn that stuff all over again. That was like my favorite subject. That's why I went into chemistry. Isn't that weird? Because of neuroscience, yeah. So, but all the cell potentials and action potentials, and synthesis of neurotransmitters, and so, right? Okay, now there is a best answer for this, and it's probably just B, diffusion or passive transport. But they both involve, like, facilitated and diffusion or passive transport both involve high to low concentration gradients. And active transport could, but usually it's the other way. <laughs> right. Now, that's the end of the lipids chapter. The homework's due next time we meet. And now we're going to go into amino acids. <sighs> you know, and I'm just going to say this book is wearing me out. Since there's no class on Wednesday, are we having a quiz on Monday? Yeah, we should have a quiz on Monday. I'll tell you what I want you to know. <laughs> I'm not even going to be here on Thursday. Why don't we have Because you've been so good, I can give you the day off. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Yeah, you guys keep stuck it out this long. You should have Wednesday off. You know what I tell you what? Thanksgiving? No, you still have to come, sorry. <laughs> That's your penance for having to eat so much turkey on Thursday. You're all gonna want to sleep the rest of the semester. You almost saw it though, huh? I know. That would be nice. Okay, so chapter 19, amino acids and proteins. Those were the homework problems. Sorry, I put it back up. There's not that many. Uh, it's a quick chapter. I might even be able to get through it today. Uh, 19. Yeah, it's a frighteningly short chapter. And I will tell you, the, the slides, if you see, a, I, I, what I usually do is I take the book slides. So if you want the complete set of slides, I can give you the slides that the publisher puts out. And then I hack them up. I just chop them all up because it's real boring to have me stand here and talk and you read a slide and it'd be the same thing. Uh, but uh, if you see somewhere in here, all of a sudden... The title ends in the word the. All they did was copy and paste text and paste it in, didn't even edit it. So there were like all kinds of slides that were messed up. There's whole sections missing. So <laughs> hopefully I cover everything in here. But if you want those slides, I'll give them to you. These are my slides now. Ah, chapter 19, amino acids and proteins. Uh, there are some core chemistry, core skills. Uh, that first one, I just used the ones the book put up there. That first one you really don't need to know. You don't know to calculate the pH. But you need to know what low pH means and what high pH means. So let me explain to you low and high pH. Oh, actually, let me do it like this. I'm going to make a scale. It's going to go left to right. I'm going to put 7 in the middle. That's 7.0, not 70. How about I put it on the bottom so the decimal doesn't get obliviated? Oh, I won't put a decimal. That's even better. Well, that's not even close to the middle, is it? <laughs> I have to zoom in to draw, and then I zoomed in, and I thought I hit the middle, but apparently I did not, so that'll be the middle. This is 7. Put 7 in the middle. Put 0 on this end and 14 on this end. This is neutral 7. Fourteen is basic, and zero is acidic. So, everything from seven on down is acidic, and seven on up is basic. That's the way that chart works. Okay. Um, what does acidic mean? Lot excess hydrogen. And that's all you really need to know. You don't need to remember the calculation. Excess hydrogen. Can I, you mind if I, this is my abbreviation for excess. Excess. 
I'm going to write it as H plus. So there's more H plus there than there is OH minus. On the other end, and I'm going to write this in terms of just H plus, okay? Low H plus. And I'll pick a little note on the side here, XS. If H plus is low, what is there excess of? OH minus. Good. So excess hydrogen, low pH, below 7. Excess, uh, low hydrogen at high pH. Okay. And we're going to use this information when we talk about amino acids in a little bit. And so you need to just understand, like, oh, the pH is this. Below this value, there's going to be a lot of hydrogen. If pH is above this value, there's going to be not very much hydrogen. Okay? Okay. Good. Uh, I had to make this slide because they had no slide like this. But you like my color? I thought the color was good. So there are 20 common amino acids. This is start in the middle, okay? There's 20 common amino acids, and they all have the same structure. And since we've all had organic chemistry, an amine is an NH2. And when we say acid in organic chemistry, what are we talking about? Is that? Not hydrogen, just not the general class of... A carboxylic acid is usually what we're talking about. So an amino acid is, it has an amine terminal, but you notice it has a plus on it, okay? And it has a carboxylic acid that has a minus on it. The reason we draw it like this is because at physiological pHs, Carboxylic acids are usually deprotonated, and amines are usually protonated. So as it exists in our body like normally, amino acids have that sort of structure, okay? Now, R is different, can be different, and whatever R is determines which of the 20 amino acids that it is. So you change the R group. You change the amino acid. But they all have the base, same basic structure, and they all have the same basic stereochemistry, like arrangement <laughs> of space. We'll talk about that more later. So there are nine or ten essential amino acids. What, it, what were essential fats? We talked about essential fats. What does essential fat mean? What's that? You have to eat it, yeah. You have to eat the fat. Well, there are essential amino acids well, essential lipids are essential because maybe our body makes some of them, but we don't make enough. So essential amino acids are ones, are, some of them our body can make, but we just can't make enough. Why is there nine or ten? It depends on your stage in life, okay? And we'll go over the amino acids uh, and what Private Tim Hall means in a little bit, but that's a mnemonic to remember which ones are essential, okay? Turns out, um, well, I'll get to it later. Depending on, your, like, premature infants, right, can't make, I think it's arginine, and adults can, so it's conditionally essential. And there's a lot of amino acids that are actually conditionally essential amino acids, but for the most part, as adults, we could make nine of them that we need, or there's nine that we need that we, that we can't make. So we have, to, we have to eat those. And then there's dispensable ones, which means we can make plenty of it, <laughs> right? And the mnemonic for that, I just came up with this day, is a saga. So this is like an, a saga of Private Tim Hall, and that gives us all a bunch of the amino acids. So, so kind of know what an amino acid is? If you start linking them together, bonding them together, and we'll talk about the bond and what that means, then you start to form what are known as peptides, okay? It's two amino acids is typically, typically called a dipeptide, okay? Three amino acids would be tripeptide. Four would be tetra, penta. They're lazy. Oh, that should say, sorry, that should say from two to 20. <coughs> I need to what? fix that. Oh, oligo? Yeah, oligo. Oligo just means a few, like in Greek. Ah, few peptides. It's from two on up. 
Typically, it means 10 to 20, but I thought, well, maybe I should, again, that should be really 2 to 20. But typically, we're talking 10 to 20. And then proteins are polypeptides. So proteins carry out, like, all the major functions of your body, all the things that do work. They're like the little workers in your body that do stuff. They make DNA and RNA. They make the amino acids that we can make. They transport materials from one part of your body to another. They allow things to go inside and out of your cells. They're responsible for the production of energy. Hair. I don't know why that came out of my head. But I thought, hell, oh, yeah, hair, yeah. Um, structural, like structural things. Your ability to move your arm like this is based on proteins that bind your muscle fibers together. And your muscle fibers are made out of proteins. So. <laughs> anyways, there's like they're used for everything. So, anyways, uh, the sm not to be confusing about this, they can be pretty small, actually. Okay, the smallest known protein is 20 amino acids. That's tiny. The largest is like 37 or 38 thousand amino acids. The molecular weights are in the millions and millions and millions. Okay? And people have figured out the structures of these things. Like they go through to figure out what every it's crazy. They're crazy people out there and it's cool. Okay. Yeah, so there are 20 different amino acids. They range in size from small as 20 amino acids up to 34,000 amino acids. They have some function. We'll go over that later. This is kind of a summary of what I've been talking about. And they're characterized by function and location. Um, I meant to put more things on there, but function and location, I'll stick with that for now. And some really fun websites, if you want to waste a ton of time, are these two. And you go there, they talk about proteins, and they show you three-dimensional structures, and you can move them around, and it's very cool. Um, this one on the bottom is... Uh, Pretty sure this one at the bottom is the Brookhaven National Data Bank for protein structures, and they just collect protein structures as people get them. So if you want to compare like the protein structure for some function or maybe some uh, con uh, structural protein in different species, they have them all lined up in there, and they tell you like how they're different, and you can look at the structures. It's very cool. All right, let's go over some of the functions. Okay, I don't expect you to remember, like, all of this detail over here, <laughs> but you should try to memorize what the types of functions are. So you have structural proteins. That provides us with things like, right, hair, tendons, cartilage. Contractile proteins. Right, so that's muscle movement. Those are the actin and myosin filaments that you find inside uh, muscle cells, muscle fibers. Transport, just carry stuff. Right. Lipo lipoproteins are what we talked about at the very end of the last chapter. Lipoproteins are part of the transport of fats in your body, for example, from one location to another. Chylomicrons fall in that same category. That's from your digestion to your liver. Uh, they're involved in storage, storage of nutrients like casein as a protein, right? Or ferritin actually stores iron. That's why when you eat liver, you get so much iron. Ugh. I'm an American. I don't eat organ meat. Thank you very much. I try not to, except for chorizo, and I'll eat that. But now I found soy riso. I'm not going to eat it anymore. I'm just going to eat the soy riso. It's really good. What? Oh. Now you're going to have to prove it. <laughs> we should have chorizo. We could have a protein potluck. Protein potluck? Hey, I'm behind in class. You're just putting me more behind. So, uh, and there's enzymes, like, you, you hear about proteins all the time, and I think a lot of people think it's just enzymes, but there's enzymes that are also proteins, and they do a lot of the chemical transformations. And then there's protections, like aminoglobulins, they like to 
they stimulate the immune response to kill things in your body. Okay. You should know that left-hand column of the types. You don't need to know all the types of, yeah, that whole, the right-hand side, no. This left column, yes, classes. Okay. What actually you'll find, though, if you try to look this up, it just depends on how picky people want to get how many things are in the list. This is probably the most like extensive list of things and functions that I've seen. I think it's pretty good, so it's worth knowing. Ah, okay, so amino acids, and we'll build our proteins. Um, this is known as the alpha carbon. Uh, it's alpha because it's next to the carboxylate functional group. It's alpha because it's next to the amine functional group. So alpha just means the first carbon next to the functional group. <coughs> Commonly, the carboxylate at physiological pHs will be negative, and at physiological pHs, the, ammonia, the amine will be in an ammonium group, so it'll have a charge. We call this situation where you're both positive and negative charge a Zwitter ion. I think I have that on another slide, but I'll write it there. So it's a Zwitter ion in the sense that Zwitter just means, uh, what does Zwitter mean? I looked it up the other day because I was like, what does Zwitter mean? I forgot. Let me see if I have it on one of my other slides. Oh, hang on. Yeah, Zwitter just means hybrid. So it's a hybrid ion. It has two things. Okay. So this R group can be, for the smallest amino acid, can be a hydrogen. That's glycine. Right? You don't need to know all the names. Well, actually, you do need to know the names. You don't need to know all the structures. There's glycine, and um, the next, this one that's shown here with the meth methyl group is known as alanine. Okay. But hydrogen is the smallest one, and then it gets bigger from there. Hmm, anything else? What do you think about the solubility of this at physiological pH? It's got charge on it, right? Probably pretty soluble at physiological pH. Yeah. Okay. <sighs> oh, yeah, well, there's Witter right up there. But Witter just means, uh, anyways, I already said, hybrid. Now, little note here. Plus, minus. One plus, plus. One minus, what's that? Zero. Zero. It's neutral, right? It turns out for every amino acid, okay, there's a pH at which it's neutral. So if the pH is high, oh, sorry, let me start with what I started with. If the pH is low, <coughs> that means a lot of H+, plus, right? Most of the amino acids will have a positive charge. So a very low pH, amino acids will have a positive charge because when it gets high enough, there will be enough hydrogen around to protonate this oxygen. But you can't protonate this again. So if I put this in a very low pH, high hydrogen ion concentration, the carboxylate will protonate, and that will get rid of the negative charge, right? But this will stay protonated, so it will be overall positive charge. That makes sense? Yeah. Yes. Yes. No. Okay. So what would that do? Um, changes its properties. Mostly we care about these things because of how people analyze them, but we don't go into that in this class. So, yeah. <coughs> can change, yeah, it can change. Um, like if you change the pH, like at, make it very acidic. <laughs> Uh, we'll talk about this. What happens is the, the amino acids relate to each other by their functional groups on the side. So if you pro make it really acidic and you protonate the side change, it can no, inter no longer interact the same way with other amino acids. 
and so that'll cause it to denature. You can also put like sodium chloride in there. Sodium chloride, right? Positive ions will attract the negative ion. That'll also cause it to denature. So there's a lot of ways that that's done. Heat does it too because you just put enough energy in it, it breaks those associations. That causes denature. It doesn't change the peptide bonds. All it does is it breaks the interactions between amino acids. The R groups interactions change as you change the environment. Some of that is pH dependent, so sometimes it's important for that. Now, okay, so if I go to a high pH, so I get rid of all the extra H+, plus, what do you think will happen here? High pH, I'll, I'll have to pull hydrogens off, right? So this will go away. One of these will go away, right? But this didn't have a hydrogen to lose. But if I lose a hydrogen here, the charge is going to be neutral. But this will still be negative. So overall, they become negative. Okay? Every amino acid has a slightly different pH where that happens. The book was really specific. It says okay, between 5 point something and 6 point something, and I'm not that kind of person, it's between 5 and 7 okay, that that happens for most. There's a few that fall outside that range that make them special. All right, we won't go, we're not going to go into that, but I will show you some of the data for that in a second. But the pH, the pH for an amino acid where there are equally NH pluses and COO minuses is known as the isoelectric point because you have just as much positive as you do negative. Okay? So we call it an isoelectric, right, means neutral charge overall. And typically, it's between 5 and 7. And in the table of amino acids in your book, there is a hanging parenthesis there. But in the table of <coughs> amino acids in your book, I'll, they show you what the isoelectric pH is. So we'll talk about what that means here in a second. OK, so classifications. You should know the classifications, the types, and be able to recognize them. This has to do with the R group, the, the, the side chain. We call it the side chain of the amino acids. Some of them are nonpolar, and so we say they're hydrophobic groups. What does nonpolar mean? It means hydrophobic. Yeah, it means, but it means like no charges, right? Usually nonpolar, no difference in charge. So what you see is these are usually alkyl groups. Hydrogen is a nonpolar. Or aromatic, so like benzene rings. Most of the benzene ring ones are nonpolar, except the ones that have alcohol functional groups on them. Okay. Then we have the polar groups, polar side groups. These are hydrophilic, okay, and they're also generally hydrogen bonding or very strongly interacting with other polar groups. This is going to be important when we start talking about structure. And then it turns out some of the side groups, and we'll show pictures of them, some of the side groups are actually extra carboxylic acid groups or extra bases like amines, okay? And so sometimes the side chain is hydrophilic and acidic, and sometimes it's hydrophilic <coughs> and basic. So that, that side chain is a carboxylic acid or an amine, that, yeah. Would that give it an overall? Yeah, it can give it a negative charge at the neutral pH. Yeah. And the ones that are amines can be positive charges at neutral pH. That was a good catch there. Good observation. Uh, I don't care if you know this table. <laughs> I know I shouldn't say that, but <laughs> it's basically what I said. There's a bunch of nonpolars, there's neutral, there's acidic, and there's basic. I don't care that you know how many of each one there are, but you should notice that there are a lot more nonpolar ones than there are individually of the polar kinds. But if you look, there's three polar groups. So what that's a total of 11 of 20. So slightly, it's almost 50-50, but it's about even, I should say. A little bit more of the hydrophilic ones. But they're all classified differently. So. All right, so uh, your book tried to show all of these on one slide, and I'm like, no, that just will not work. So here's an example of an amino acid that has a ring in it. This is proline. This is an oddball. Its isoelectric point is 6.3. OK, 
Okay, pH. So when pH is 6.3, this will be positive, that'll be negative. If it's more acidic than 6.3, then this gets a hydrogen, and overall it's positive. Okay? The way I always remember it, <laughs> rather than thinking through every single time, if there's more acid, acid has what charge? Well, hydrogen has what charge? Positive. positive. So it's more acid, it's positive. Less acid, it's negative. Okay? Uh, tryptophan. more acidic. So this will pick up a hydrogen and it'll be positive. All right. And if it's high pH, all right, basic, remember pH going up means hydronium's going down. <laughs> They're opposite because pH is minus log of hydronium ion concentration. Okay, and then there's glycine, then so for glycine and alanine, these things are both exactly the same. So at pH 6. So at pH 7, what would happen? Be higher. Overall, you know it's going to be negative, right? That means this hydrogen's gone, and it's neutral, and this is still negative. Okay? So that's the thinking of it. Now, you'll notice a couple other things. There's three-letter and one-letter abbreviations. I expect you to learn three-letter abbreviations. Okay? I don't expect you to remember the structures. I expect you to remember the three-letter abbreviations because most of them are pretty easy because it's the first three letters of the name. <laughs> okay, and there's 20 of them. I think you could probably memorize 20. Okay, so there's proline. There's pro. So memorize these. Memorize. Okay, so amino acids have either three-letter or one-letter abbreviations, which is great until you have a bunch of them that start with A. There's like four of them that start with A. So they can't all be A, right? Alanine happens to be the A. Glycine is G, right? It, tryptophan is W. I have no idea where the W comes from. It makes no sense to me at all. And proline is P, okay? Give you a couple other examples. These are the nonpolar ones, though. Okay, they have nonpolar side chains. This is aromatic over here. All right, this is a ring, hydrocarbon, hydrogen, and methyl group. Those are neutral or nonpolar. Here are some examples of the hydrophilic groups. Oh, here's an asparagine. All right, unfortunately, that's ASN because there's arginine, alanine, and what have I missed? Aspartate, yeah, or aspartic acid, yeah. Okay, so there's a bunch of... Oh, actually, sorry. That's what this file is. You don't need to know the structures, but it gives you the uh, one and three letter. Yeah, I just learned the, learn the three letter. Unless you're oh, planning to go into biochemistry. <laughs> But it shows you all the structures in bond line format, which I like. I'm passing enough back that they should fill in the back over there, but I'm not for you guys. And if you don't like it, make paper airplane out of it. I don't care. I do care, but. I think it's a little bit clearer than the one in your book just because you get to hold it and it's bigger. You don't need the molecular weights, but I found this. I searched around the internet for a while before I found what I liked. So it has small, it has the aromatic, it has the basic and the acidic <coughs> on there. Okay, so um, yeah, there's asparagine, threonine. Again, it has, this is the polar amino acids, hydrophilic group, has an OH, it's an alcohol. This is a tyrosine, has an OH, right? So this is an amide, you remember these are polar. And this is SH thiol. Cysteine is an important one uh, um, because it is one, the one, if you've learned some biology, it's the one that makes the disulfide bridge. 
Okay. Um, just some other examples. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah, and the PIs are down here at the bottom. So these are all around between five and six. Uh, and here's two. I picked two. One's a, an acid, acidic side chain or carboxylate side chain. And one of them is this weird, I think it's called an amido group. And I don't remember what it's called exactly. But that's uh, arginine. Um, but they have charged side chains. Uh, this is an acidic side chain. This is glutamic acid or glutamate or glutamine. Okay. So we're going to draw the Zwitter ions for the amino acids serine and aspartate. How do you do that? You get the sheet out. <laughs> Find serine. Oh, is it even on here? Oh, it's at the top. I'm like looking at the bottom. So I'm going to change the pen color because I'm tired of writing things that look like, oh, that's not right. All right. So serine. Here's NH2. Let's start with this. Draw the structure that you can find. And then this is um, like that. And this is COOH. And then this is just the structure that's on the sheet. And now we're going to draw the Zwitter ion. So the Zwitter ion means the plus and the minus, right? So think about it like this. The carboxylate group is going to lose a hydrogen. And the amine group is going to gain a hydrogen, right? It's almost like it goes like this. It doesn't, but almost like it is. So you end up with NH3 plus, because it picked up a hydrogen, and then C. Well, let me get rid of that H that I drew in there. Oh, drew too many. Yeah. Uh, just because that's what you're used to seeing. Okay, yeah. So there's a hydrogen. Ah, I erased it. Hydrogen here. And then this is the CH2OH. And this goes to COO minus. Okay, so that's this witter ion. For serine, now go ahead and find aspartic acid or aspartate. I don't know what they put on the sheet. How'd you get CH2? Because it's not on the sheet. Oh. That's CH2. Oh, Yeah, there's a band there, so it has to be carbon there. Details. Details. So go ahead and try to do, um, it says up here, aspartate or aspartic acid. Okay. Because aspartate or aspartic acid. So see if we can find it. No, no, they just asked that question. So this CH2, this is CH2 here. I just didn't draw it in up here because I was running out of room. And then on, so on the paper, it has, where does the extra C and the H come from? The middle so, hang on. Oh, I know. Yeah. 